So humans have been living in cities in some form or another for thousands of years. Um, and you might think a lot's changed in that time. And indeed, if you compare, say, a modern metropolis to a Middle Ages fortress city, there are some pretty significant differences. But a surprising amount has remained constant as well. Both of these cities have houses and roads, they have places for social congregation and recreation, and they have public infrastructure like sewage systems. A lot stayed the same because the basic realities that <coughs> define and constrain the way that humans cooperate and coexist haven't changed that much. When we want to work, play, trade, be safe, be warm, we come together in cities to do it. And as external circumstance has changed, the form of the city has adapted, so when the threat of marauding neighboring city-states diminished, the walls came down around the fortress cities and railway lines reached out, connecting the world together. But in essence, the city has remained a relatively crude and simplistic machine. Le Corbusier famously said that houses should be machines for living in. And in many ways, that's what cities are. They're machines for us to live in and coexist in. Um, as we improve technology, we've refined these machines a bit. We now have mass transit systems that go underground and you know, power grids to distribute energy and warmth. But as a machine, the city is still quite basic. If you compare the jump in complexity of machines pre and post the digital revolution, then cities are still quite firmly stuck in that pre-digital world. But that's about to change, and change at a phenomenal pace, because smart cities are coming. And unlike previous adaptions of the form of the city to circumstance, this change promises to be revolutionary. So when thinking about cities as machines, it's helpful to compare them to organisms. Right? Um, if a city is a machine for humans to live in, think about how fantastically simplistic it is compared to the machine that is the actual human body. A lot of the functions that a city has to perform and the challenges that it faces are quite similar to that of an organism. In cities, we have to transport goods and supplies around, and we do that by loading them up into lumbering cars and trucks and driving them from A to B. We have to collect and remove waste and toxins, and we do that with bins and garbage disposal services. Compare that to the brilliance of the human circulatory system, continuously delivering nutrients wherever they're needed, seamlessly removing toxins. Humans have the nervous system to let us know what's going on in every part of our body, what condition everything is in, if something's changed or become damaged. It's an informational system that gives us complete awareness and instant feedback about what's going on in our body. Compare that to the slow, laborious process of inspecting a city, going and peering into every nook and cranny, looking for signs of change or cracks, and writing reports and collecting them. So why aren't our cities better? Why aren't they more like organisms? Well, in many ways, it's the laws of physics, right? Cities are the way they are in a large part because we've been working within the confines of the physical world. Macroscopic objects are heavy and static, and they don't move themselves, they're not smart. So if you want to change their configuration, you have to go and pick them up and carry them yourself. Sound and light doesn't travel very easily through a city. Light doesn't go through brick walls, and cities are big. So it's not easy to know what's going on in every part of a city at any moment. We don't have access to that information the way the nervous system does in the body. Technology's helped a bit, but cities are still fundamentally a bunch of unconnected objects just sitting there obeying the laws of physics. The digital world is quite different, though. The most complex and sophisticated systems we've ever made aren't physical machines at all. They're virtual ones. A modern computer operating system is still not as advanced as a human body, but it's getting there. It's orders of magnitude more brilliant and impressive than any physical machine we've made. And that's because the rules are a bit different in the digital, the cyber world. Right? You're not bound by the laws of physics in the same way. Digital information flows freely. It travels at the speed of light. Virtual objects can be created and destroyed in an instant, moved from A to B at will. The digital world is in many ways a blank canvas. It's a chance for us to make the world the way we want it to be, to write the rules from scratch. And that means that our virtual systems can be a lot more like organisms if we want them to be. The key is connectedness and availability of information. All the parts interconnected as a whole, intercommunicating, exchanging data, and sensitive to their surroundings. In the digital world, nothing is opaque. Everything flows. So how does this help us with cities? Well, things start to get interesting when we mix the physical and the virtual worlds together. And what's allowing us to do that is the Internet of Things, 
and smart devices everywhere. Smart toasters and fridges and thermostats in the home and smart letterboxes and traffic lights out there in the world. Every device, big or small, is starting to have a little computer inside of it, connected to the internet and generating data and sharing data. And these connected devices can be the conduit or the bridge between the physical world and the virtual world. They can link the two together. Because they're not sitting in an office somewhere like a PC on a desk. They're embedded out there in the world at a place, woven into the environment around us. And they have sensors in them, so they can know what's going on around them. They can sense their environment, right? A lot of these things can know if they're hot or cold, changed or broken or stolen or where they are. And this means that they can take information about the physical world and translate it into digital signals and send it back somewhere. So once we start interlacing these things into our cities and making this into a kind of smart city, we have this mesh of all these devices. And this gives us that visibility, the connectedness, like something like the nervous system has. These can tell us what's happening in the city at every moment. They can make things not opaque anymore and we can begin to know what's going on. And that opens up the door for us to start improving the way our cities work, make them more like organisms. So I'm going to talk about one way in which we can improve them, and that's the area of security and threats. So both cities and organisms face threats, right, which are external factors that have the potential to disrupt normal operation and cause damage. And the key challenge with threat is detection. How do you know if something bad has happened, or is happening, or is about to happen? How do you spot a threat early before it's too late? It's difficult because cities can face a very wide range of threats. Critical infrastructure can be damaged or destroyed. Power stations can overheat. Bridges can collapse. Transport systems can be disrupted by obstacles falling on tracks. Water supplies can become contaminated. Natural disasters can strike at any time. Some of the threats that cities face are the results of deliberate human action and agency, like crime and terrorism, where someone intends to break things or cause harm. Others are the result of uncontrollable external influences like the weather or disease, all have the potential to pose an existential challenge to the city. And the difficult thing is the novelty of these threats. There's so many ways that something can go wrong or break, either deliberately or accidentally, in a complex system like a city, that it's impossible to define all these different sources of risk in advance, to say this is where the threats will come from, this is how they will unfold, this is how someone might attack us, this is what the threat will look like when it happens. You have to try and detect and look for something that you don't quite know what you're looking for. And that's a very difficult challenge. How do you try to find something if you don't know what you're looking for? Well, it's a difficult challenge, but it's not a new challenge. This is one that organisms have evolved to meet over millions of years. Um, the human body faces threats every day, right, in the form of pathogens that are an external influence or factor that can cause damage and disruption and disease in the body. And the human body has had to develop a way to deal with these without having had to see them all before. Right? There are novel strains of viruses and bacteria all the time. So the human body needs a way to be able to detect and recognize that it's under attack without necessarily knowing distinguishing features of the attacker or the source of threat. And the way that it does that is the innate immune system and its ability to know self and recognize not self. So what this means is that the human immune system has a great understanding and awareness of the normal bodily environment. It knows what normal looks like. It knows how to recognize itself. So when it's attacked and an external influence like a pathogen gets in, it's able to recognize this as alien, unwanted, unexpected, a potential threat. Not because it's seen it before necessarily or knows anything about it, but because it first knows itself really well. And then against that comparison basis, it can recognize this as not self, identify it as unwanted. So can we take inspiration from that? Can we do the same thing? For our cities, once they're smart and they have these devices woven into them, gathering data, can we make them a digital immune system that knows self? Well, we have all the data we need from these devices. We're collecting it. They're telling us what's going on in every part of the city at every moment. So we can just look at that data over time. We can use it to build up an understanding of what the day-to-day -day life of the city looks like, what normal activities are, what typical traffic patterns are, what typical water levels are, what the weather's normally like, how these vary overnight to day and the week to the weekend. This information gives us a pattern of life of what goes on in the city. And for a city, that pattern of life is the definition of self, right? So in the analogy or the metaphor of the immune system, for a city, self is normal behavior, the pattern of life, expected occurrences. Not self becomes unexpected behavior outside the normal pattern of life, potentially threatening. And once we have all this information in the digital world, we can build the systems we need to do this. It's just math. 
We have the machine learning and the AI techniques that we need now to do this. We can feed all the data we're collecting to machine learning algorithms, and we can train them on that data to know what normal is, and then be able to score unusual things. It's basically probability theory. What you do is you score the probability of every sequence of events occurring. You say, based on what I've seen before, what I know to be normal for the city, would I expect this pattern of activity that's currently unfolding to happen? Is this low or high probability? Would this be normal in the day-to-day -day operations of the city? Or is this unexpected, unusual, outside the pattern of life? And if we can do that and spot these unusual behaviors, then we can start to detect threats that we haven't seen before and haven't been able to predict in advance. So let me give you one example of how this would work. Um, you have to think about the kind of scenarios where a sequence of small deviations that would be potentially unexpected can add up into a significant threat that you wouldn't be able to conceive of in advance, but which represents a deviation from normal all the way. So imagine something like there's been unusual traffic in some part of the city, maybe there were roadworks or an accident earlier in the day, and now we have chaos at an intersection, and a heavy goods vehicle like a truck has a near-miss collision and swerves off the road and hits the side of a bridge. And when it hits the bridge, it manages to rupture and damage a sewage pipe that's running under the road by the side, and this sewage pipe starts leaking, and it manages to leak sewage that infects the local water supply in the area. And now we have contaminated drinking water, and people start falling ill. You have a, a localized health problem. Sort of thing that's important to detect, but very hard, because you wouldn't necessarily conceive of these sequence of events happening in that way. But every step along the way represents a change in the normal pattern of life of the city. It's a deviation from self, right? The initial traffic conditions that start the whole thing are anomalous. It's not normal. If we have sensors and smart devices and traffic lights and roads and cars learning and profiling and baselining the normal arrangement of traffic, then this will stand out as unexpected, low probability, not what we would normally expect the traffic to look like at that time of day. When the sewage pipe starts leaking, if we have smart pipes that are learning levels of sewage and sewage use in different parts of the city at different times, they're going to record a drop in the expected level of sewage. Something will have changed again. When the water composition changes, when it gets contaminated by the sewage, if we have smart taps that are analyzing water distribution, they can say something's off, it's not the same water composition as normal. If you want, we can go so far as to say people's behavior is going to change when they fall ill. So if we have sensors in the pavement that are recording normal levels of pedestrian footfall, they'll record a, a change in pedestrian activity when people don't go to work the next day and there's less people walking on the streets. All of these are weak indicators that on their own may not be that significant. But together, they add up to a picture of something that's potentially threatening. And correlating that together becomes quite easy and doable in the digital world. You just have to get access to the information. We just never knew what was going on up till now in the world in an adequate way to support this kind of processing. So this isn't too far away. Um, all these smart embedded devices are coming to a city near you pretty soon. And they're going to unlock and they will enable things like this and people will do it. And this is an opportunity. It's a great opportunity. It's not something to be feared or lamented. A lot of the rhetoric around smart cities often focuses on the potential ways in which they might introduce risk or make us less secure in terms of opening us up to cyber attack and things. And that's true. That's a real risk. And we have to take that seriously. But it's a challenge that we can meet head on. We can do that with human ingenuity and diligence and hard work. Right? We can make stronger encryption and better cyber defenses and superior software development practices. The digital world is ours to build from scratch, and it's up to us to make it not just safe, but far safer than the physical world ever was before. And as we begin to mix these two worlds together with the Internet of Things and embedding our computing devices out into the physical environment, then we can start to make the physical world safer than that ever was before. Thank you.